Thank you to those who have joined already. Um, we're still waiting for other people to join. Uh, the event will start soon. Thank you. Hello to everyone who've joined so far. Uh, we're still waiting for other people to join us, so the event will start in a few minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to those of you who have joined already. Uh, we'll be starting in a minute or two. Um, I think we've seen a couple of questions already put on the chat. Um, if you wouldn't mind putting them on the Q&A button instead, uh, otherwise they won't be picked up. Thanks. Okay, I think we'll make a start. Um, so hello everyone and thanks for joining in the latest of this series of In Conversation With. Um, as most of you know, it's a series of one-to-one -one discussions um, where we interview recognized and celebrated individuals that, that we think will be of direct interest to our CLA members, that is you. Um, so on behalf of the CLA, I'm really delighted to welcome you to another one of uh, these events that have proved uh, so successful so far. Today is no exception. Uh, we're expecting um, over 700 people uh, to watch this, which would be great. Uh, my name is Mike Valencia and I'm the Regional Director for the Southeast uh, for the CLA. Um, so today's discussion brings together our uh, Director of External Affairs, Jonathan Roberts, and Professor Alistair Driver, who's the Director for Rewilding Britain. Alistair is an ecologist and conservationist, and he's dedicated to providing a more resilient and diversified future for rural communities throughout the country, and for us to become world leaders in tackling the global climate emergency and biodiversity crisis through land and water management. Alistair, welcome. I'll remind all of you that today's session is being recorded for future use, uh, and it will be available on our website for our members. 
Um, as ever, the format is that your microphones and uh, videos will be muted throughout the session. Uh, but um, Jonathan will have a discussion with Alistair initially and will then pose questions put forward by yourselves. Uh, and as I said earlier, do please use the Q&A button uh, for that purpose. So thank you again. Um, I will now hand you over to Jonathan and Alistair. Michael, thank you so much for uh, organising this event with you and your team. Good afternoon uh, to you all, wherever you are. Uh, I myself, uh, broadcasting live from the village of Sonning in Berkshire, and by pure happenstance, about 100 yards that way, is our uh, guest for the afternoon, uh, Alastair Driver. Alastair, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Now, I know we've got a lot of people on the call who know a great deal about rewilding already. We do have quite a few people, I think, who might not know much about it at all. So perhaps you can start by introducing us to rewilding. What is it? Um, how is it of environment, environmental benefit? And how is it different to what you might call normal conservation? Yeah, well, I think the first thing to do is to explain why why we need rewilding and, and i feel i can say this um, i've been involved in nature conservation for over 40 years in this country and i've been involved in over a thousand uh, habitat creation and restoration projects working with farmers and landowners for for decades uh, along with thousands of other people and the simple fact is that we are still going backwards on biodiversity and and of course we're still going uh, backwards on climate change uh, mitigation. Uh, so, so my view is, yes, we need traditional nature conservation and we need agri-environment type schemes and we need good planning policies, etc. But we must need something else as well because just doing what we've been doing is not enough. So we have to keep going with the nature reserve traditional conservation approach, but we need something else as well. And that something else is rewilding in my view. Now, Definition of rewilding, I mean, no one owns a definition, but Rewilding Britain, the organization I work for, um, has a definition and sort of uh, potted down to a sort of tweetable version. It's the large scale restoration of ecosystems to the point where nature is allowed to take care of itself. But there are many things that I need to explain around that, and hopefully that will come out during the, the course of the conversation. Um, but the important thing to remember is that we are talking about a spectrum of activity here. And what, what we at Rewilding Britain are trying to do is encourage people to make significant strides up that spectrum where they wish to do so and where it is appropriate for them to do so. Thank you. And why don't you tell us a bit more about the organisation you work for, uh, Rewilding Britain, and, and what's really the extent of the ambition uh, for the organisation on Rewilding? Yeah, well, first of all, Rewilding Britain is a very small charity. There are approximately 10 of us working part time. We're about, well, less than five FTEs worth. So very small and intending to remain small and act as a catalyst for rewilding in this country. And just to put the scale of the ambition into context, we, um, we, we set ourselves a target um, three years ago or so when myself and my colleague, Rebecca Wrigley, who's our chief exec, started in the role three and a half years ago, uh, we set a target for a, a million hectares to be rewilded by 2100 in Britain, England, Scotland and Wales. And a million hectares is actually less than 5%, slightly less than 5%. So that, that's the kind of order of challenge. But also just to put that in perspective for England at the moment, we have less than 0.3% that we would consider to be rewilding at scale. So we've got a long way to go. And 5% doesn't sound much, but it's a, it's a, it's a big challenge. Yes, yeah, so it's clearly we've got a long way to go. And I think maybe we'll unpick uh, how we might get there, uh, if, if indeed it is the right thing to do to get there uh, later on in the conversation. Um, but you'll be aware, I'm sure, that rewilding does have, at times, a slightly controversial reputation. I've heard people arguing, for example, that it takes land out of you know, food production and therefore could damage food security. Um, what's the truth? What's your perspective on, on, on that charge? 
Yeah, I, I can understand people raising that because there is the concept that often people say, well, if you rewild air everywhere, how, how are we going to produce food? Where's the food coming from? Well, as I just explained, we're not <laughs> suggesting we should rewild everywhere by any means. But, but actually, my view is, if we are really serious about food security and food production, we must look at food waste. You know, that is a massive issue for not just for Britain, but, you know, for the whole world. But, you know, we waste something like 40% of the food we produce to eat. So we really need to be tackling that if we're serious about it. Um, the other thing to say is that all the rewilding projects that I'm dealing with, and there are an increasing number as every week passes, um, they are all still producing food of some sort. Uh, it might be less in terms of quantity. Uh, it might, it's usually higher quality, um, but it, it, it still involves some kind of food production. Uh, and that's because uh, as part of a, a rewilding system, you are going to need some kind of grazing animals. If you haven't got native grazing animals, large herbivores, then having uh, non-native herbivores, rare breeds, etc., is the next best thing that one can do to help ensure that you have a, a heterogeneity in the landscape, a mosaic of habitats developing. And so if you're going to have grazing animals, then obviously harvesting them is a, is a, a, a serious proposition. And that's what rewilding uh, landowners and clusters of landowners are still doing. So is it desirable to have a sort of a completely rewilded uh, area with no human intervention whatsoever? Or, or, or is there always going to be a degree of uh, human intervention and in land management in a rewilded uh, uh, part of the country? Yeah, th this, I mean, again, remember what I said about the spectrum of activity and even within a given rewilding area, say, say we do manage to get clusters of landowners uh, teamed up, operating over several thousand hectares, which is what you know, we would like to see, um, then there will still be different approaches within that overall area. And there will be some areas, for example, which are core areas for nature conservation, which have uh, fantastic wildflower rich grasslands. You wouldn't want to give up on those whilst you're rewilding the rest. So you, you, you keep conserving and managing the best of what you've got. And the same applies to uh, big estates, which have a mix of very marginal land compared with very productive land. They're not going to give up on that productive land in terms of cropping uh, or, or meat production, for example, but they may be prepared to significantly modify what they do on the less productive uh, parts of, their, of the farm or the estate. And that's, and that's what's happening in many cases. So I think so I joined the CLA about a year ago as Director of External Affairs. And one of the first things that I read about when I was uh, preparing for my interviews was rewilding. And it was about the reintroduction of bears and wolves and, uh, and so on. Um, uh, that might be the more extreme end of the spectrum, uh, I suppose. But what sort of species are we seeing being uh, reintroduced? And, and, and what is that, the, the, the broader potential for addressing that loss of biodiversity? Yeah, well, it, it, first of all, I should say, it, you know, it is very important that when we are rewilding, we're trying to reinstate natural processes and doing so at scale. Uh, it is really important that we consider what is missing in terms of ecological functioning. And, and there are some key species missing from our landscape, which provide very, very important roles. And you, you can't get more obvious species than the beaver for that because of the incredible ecosystem engineering that that species does. So as you know, there are no beaver reintroduction proposals. There are enclosures with beavers in. Um, there are escapees, uh, particularly in Scotland, of course. And there are, and there is down on the River Otter in Devon, this uh, beaver trial, which has been running for five, uh, just over five years. Um, I hope that government will accept that we should now have beavers back in the landscape, in the right places, with the right management strategy in place. I've been on a group which has help to, to provide a good strategy for future beaver introductions. We are really ready to go. There are plenty of places where landowners are willing and able. And really, I'd like, you know, personally and Rewilding Britain, certainly as an organization, would like to see that happening strategically. There are other species which are already being reintroduced, like pine martins and white-tailed eagles, for example. But it's not just these 
big charismatic megafauna that we need to be thinking about. There are plant species, for example, Scots pine, juniper, etc. Um, and there are invertebrates, butterflies, lower plants. You know, there's a whole range of things that one should consider when trying to re-establish uh, a natural regime with, with, with the right elements of the ecosystem to restore this natural system. I saw the first stalk chicks in, was it 600 years? Yes, happened. that's right. D down at Nap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing. Yeah, amazing. There'll, story. there'll be lots of babies being delivered in baskets in, <laughs> yeah. in the years to come. Um, but look, you know, so many of our members um, may well be watching this thinking, well, this is all uh, well and good. We care about biodiversity. We care about the environment. Our, our landowners do need to make money. They do need to run commercial uh, adventures. Do we see rewilding as a commercial venture or is it purely an environmental one? Well, it, the, the primary driver is to restore a healthy functioning ecosystem at scale where, where nature is leading. That is the primary uh, function. But in order for that to be manageable and deliverable in such a crowded country uh, with relatively small land ownership, um, obviously we've got to make it work economically. And there are several, this is quite a complicated area, there's several e elements to these finances and economics. There's the economics with re re in relation to the landowner and the tenants and the people who occupy that piece of land, it has to work for them. Then there's the economics of the local community and the, the spin-off impacts on people who live in that area, neighbours, etc. And then there are the wider economic benefits to society as a whole, particularly down catchment, where things that you are doing in terms of rewilding, such as uh, reducing flood risk and improving water quality through, through restoring a natural healthy ecosystem, will have economic benefits. So it, it is a complex area, but first of all, we have to make sure that it works for the individual who owns and lives and works on that land. And that is why the future environmental land management scheme proposed uh, th through this agriculture bill that's going through parliament at the moment, that's why this is so important. We have to get rewilding specifically into that scheme, particularly the higher tier of that scheme as an option for landowners because they will be delivering, if they are rewilding significantly, moving up this spectrum that I'm talking about, they're gonna be delivering multiple public goods in the same area in, a, in, a, in an efficient, a much more efficient way than randomly doing it in a scattergun approach across the country. And, 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 and what are you hearing from government in those efforts? Are they, uh, are they, are they, are they open to that argument? Um, I've certainly, been tackling DEFRA on it for some time now, and they are open to considering it. I still don't have any clear green light that it's accepted. There, we do have to get over this hurdle of it being a scary word and people per perceiving that it's all about wolves and bears and land abandonment. The reality of it at this point in time in Britain is that it's not about that. It's about this large scale ecological restoration with, with yes, suitable species reintroductions where appropriate, but only where the community is ready for it. Um, so we need to get certain individuals and parts of government over that, over that hurdle to understand what it is in reality. But the, I keep stressing, this should be an option. It's not, a, it's not something that should be forced on people. Landowners should only be embarking on it if they really want to do it. But I know from the dramatic increase in inquiries that we've been getting in the last year or so, that the interest in this from landowners, and, and many of them, by the way, are CLA members, um, uh, the interest is rocketing. And so it's time, for, in effect, it's time for policy to catch up with practice. And, and just to keep on the commercial aspects of it for a moment, you're speaking to farmers and estate managers all over the country, all over the time. And when they're talking to you about their commercial um, uh, opportunity, of their, you talk us through it, is it tourism? Uh, is it to do with shooting? Is it to do with where, where yeah. are you looking to go into? Yeah, well, the, the, the main driver, as I say, is from these individuals is that they, they want to do the right thing. That's the first thing to say. But they are all sensible business people and, and they know that the, that the future uh, ELM scheme is the opportunity to help make this pace especially to start with as you get going you know transitioning from say intensive sheep farming 
to just a few cattle and, and uh, more na nature-based products and maybe a bit of camping and B&B, etc. You know, that, that it, it requires quite a bit of investment up front and it isn't necessarily going to sail straight into, you know, profit-making system immediately. So th they are having to take the plunge, many of these, and, and they are going to need uh, public support, as it were, through this future scheme, certainly in the early years. Now, what, what I fully expect is that as time passes, so this uh, nature-based tourist economy will develop in this country because it's very, very under underutilized at the moment. You know, we have, you know, we always end up quoting NEP, for example, uh, as an example, but you could easily sustain, you know, more than one of those in every county and still make it work. Um, so there is, there is great scope for uh, increasing the amount of facilities of this kind. So you've got, you, you, they will need the Elms type payments to, to, to be safer, if you like, in, 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 the, the fi in their finances. But yes, it's things like camping and glamping, uh, safaris, tree houses, um, uh, nature guiding, and also all of the products that come from this, you know, examples. I mean, there's one example I know, one of the estates up in Northumberland produces a fantastic gin from fresh juniper uh, and bog myrtle and the various other species that are growing in the rewilded hillsides, or rewilding hillsides around them. That's just one example of another type of product that can come from the land. And, and then of course, you've still got the that, that whatever uh, agriculture is also going on, the meat products that may come, as they do at NEP, you know, there's high quality meat sold um, from, from that site as an example. We've had quite a few uh, questions coming in and we'll move on to uh, uh, questions from the, the virtual floor in a second. But about, uh, we've had quite a few questions about water requirements and, you know, there are, there, there's big chunks of the country with way too much water and equally big, chunks of country with not enough of the stuff yeah, uh, yeah how is that being managed in the uh, in, in in the projects that you're working with well the, the first thing to to remember is that if you are going to restore a healthy mix of vegetation and healthy soils you know soils is absolutely absolutely fundamental much healthier uh, soil condition uh, and quality um, if you're going to restore those, you are, you are going to be buffering extreme drought and extreme flood more effectively. Um, and, and that's particularly important when it comes to upland blanket bog and, and uh, upland slopes, which some of which may currently at the moment be extremely short and bare because they're intensively sheep grazed. And roughening those up and creating a greater mix of vegetation will help to slow the flow, retain more water in the in the landscape, but also buffer during drought conditions. And um, when I was in the Environment Agency, uh, you know, I produced uh, what I called killer facts on this. There's, there's a whole bunch of measured evidence from restoration projects around the country which show how this buffering works. And, and you can you know, reduce flood peaks by you know, 30%, for example, and, and also buffer, buffer uh, drought, drought flows so that they're more consistent in a, to a similar extent. So. Um, that really that that's the primary primary uh, opportunity is that we can use this rewilding to help to mitigate these impacts of more extreme climate events really interesting thank you i've just got one more question for you alistair before we move to questions from the floor and that's on um, that's on academia what area do you think there's been enough research in the no um we desperately need we desperately need more information. Um, I mean, key areas that I would love to see more work done on are the economics. And I know it's difficult because um, various landowners around the country are only really just getting going with this in the last few years, apart from one or two standout examples. And, and so it's difficult to, to demonstrate um, a long-term sustained economic trend. But there is scope now. You know, I've got probably a dozen or so rewilding large rewilding areas over over a thousand acres in England where there could be some really effective studies done on the economics both in terms of public goods and also in terms of uh, spin-off benefits to local communities you know bed and breakfast and visitors spending money in in the local area etc so economics is one the other one is 
measuring the combined effect of these multiple benefits that rewilding brings. There's quite a bit of work done on slowing the flow, you know, natural flood management. Uh, there's quite a bit of work done on, on carbon uh, sequestration in, in peat bogs, for example. What we, what we ideally need to be doing is, is the multiple benefits across a big area of land of multiple interventions and hopefully demonstrating uh, that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Well, thank you, Alastair, very much. We're just going to move over now to the uh, questions and answers. Uh, we've had loads come in, which is absolutely fantastic. And I, I shall um, try to uh, pick out best ones as I can in support of the team here. Um, we've, we've had one come in from, uh, from Chris here, here. How can the educational potential of rewilding projects be enhanced? Are you seeing much go on in schools and youth clubs and local communities? Um, well, first, I'll take the first question because, uh, you know, that's something that um, we are really keen on at Rewilding Britain as well, is trying to uh, increase the opportunities for education in a way that's a kind of uh, public good, if you like, that could come from, from some of the projects. Now, of course, a lot of these projects that I'm dealing with are in quite remote areas and logistically it's very difficult um, to draw strong links with schools. But I know of a project, for example, at Summerlayton near Great Yarmouth, where the landowner is very keen to try to link up with local educational authorities and institutes to particularly for impoverished communities to be able to come out and access real high quality green space. Um, so, so I would love to see more of that direct connectivity um, with giving the opportunity for kids to go out and experience something that is truly wild. And I think this COVID crisis, of course, has demonstrated the importance of being able to get out into, into good quality green space um, close to where you live, you know, walking distance, if you like, of where you live. And, and, uh, and I think it's, it's helped to show just how important that is to health and well-being. So I'd love to see greater emphasis on that. And indeed, um, that also is an area, by the way, where we need more evidence of the benefits of, of these kind of projects to society through education and through health and well-being. I have a really interesting uh, question here. You were talking earlier a little bit about um, uh, uh, species introduction, but what about the non-native species that are already here a uh, question from uh, Minda Depp here when starting up a wilding scheme what should our policy be on non-native species such as sycamore and grey squirrel yeah um so the, what i always say to the, this kind of question is think natural processes so when you are rewilding think about what would the natural processes be in this kind of landscape um, what would the balance be between healthy soils, healthy vegetation, things that eat the vegetation and things that eat the things that eat the vegetation? What would that natural balance be and how close can we get to it? And if you have an invasive species that is having a significant suppression effect on natural processes, then that needs to be considered as an intervention, um, a, a rewilding intervention. I always describe um, rewilding as, as a marathon with a sprint start and that sprint start means intervening to kickstart the rewilding process and and that that sprint start actually might last for many many years maybe even decades before you can really start to relax significantly uh, but controlling invasive species which are suppressing uh, natural regeneration of the right mix of species is something that would need to be considered as an intervention. So a classic example that often comes to my attention is rhododendron. You know, that is massively suppressing natural woodland processes in some areas and one would need to tackle it. But if you take another, uh, another example is actually um, uh, uh, NEP itself on Muntjac. Well, in NEP, they have cattle, they have ponies, they have Tamworth pigs, they have all native species of deer. It would be very difficult to say, well, muntjac are significantly impacting on natural processes in that with a, that huge range of herbivores already there uh, messing things up, as it were. So in that situation, I'd probably say, well, that's not that's not a key issue, um, whereas rhododendron is in that, in that example I've given. We're, we're seeing more and more instance 
every year of moorland wildfire? A really interesting question here from uh, Mr. Barbara Lomax. Um, is rewilding of moorland landscapes not a recipe for future catastrophe? Even lowland conservation areas, such as uh, Hatfield Moss in Doncaster, he refers to, have suffered significant carbon and habitat loss this spring. Yeah, this is a really uh, tricky one. This, I mean, um, and I'm, uh, you know, I've been to a lot of moorland sites and I've spoken to a lot of people on the ground. But the key, the key message I'm getting consistently from those who are working on the ground is that where in the few areas, and by the way, it is very few areas where rewilding has happened in moorland landscapes. In those few areas where it's happened, uh, fires are far less likely uh, to take hold. And if they do take hold, usually having spread from dry heather nearby, then they are much easier to put out in the rewilded landscape. And the simple reason for that is that the vegetation structure above ground is holding uh, significant amounts of water for much longer into the dry season. But I know that this is a very difficult issue. The thing that we have to remember is that Wildfires in this country are caused by people, and we know they're caused by arson, and they're caused by barbecues and cigarette butts predominantly. And they, and, and you can predict, and I've seen maps produced by Moors for the Future, you can see where the risk is, and it's around the edges of the Moors, close to where there are big urban populations. So we, you know, we have to think ser seriously about where the rewilding would take place, and ideally one would focus on areas where there is a much lesser risk um, because of that geographic proximity to lots of people but we also need to accept that we cannot go we cannot go on like this um, continually releasing carbon by burning more than you know it just does not fit we have a climate we have a climate crisis we are going to have to bite the bullet on this and re-wet our, our blanket bogs properly and restore a much healthier balance with nature whilst at the same time being very tactical and and sensible about where we do it to keep the risk down and we need to monitor and enforce much more strictly and raise awareness. It's very complicated and I'm not proposing, you know, suggesting for one minute that we should have a, you know, just this blanket approach and, and, and rewild everywhere because temporarily that risk will be increased as you are transitioning to the rewilding state. This is very interesting talking about how not everywhere might be suitable. Of course, you know, we, we, we have some areas where actually there is uh, improving biodiversity, uh, where people have taken very good care of their land already. Uh, would rewilding actually damage areas where there is already a delicately balanced ecosystem? Or would it enhance it? Or would you just sort of leave it alone and, and concentrate on, on, on areas where there has been a real catastrophic loss? Yeah, very important that we don't give up on the jewels in the crown. You know, I'm dealing with big rewilding areas where there are pockets of high quality habitat that really need to be preserved, conserved in that state until such time as a much greater area is rewilded and those species have the opportunity to move into patches of that greater area. Classic example, sheep drove farm in Berkshire who I've just been talking to in the last week or so, they've got 100 acres of high quality chalk grassland. They want to re start a rewilding program for the estate, but they're not going to give up on that. They will keep managing those 100 acres uh, with sheep uh, in, a, in a traditional conservation way, whilst rewilding the rest of the estate over a, a longer period of time. So it's, it's you know, common, being, you know, applying common sense and being rational are very, very important criteria for this decision making process. Really interesting questions coming from William uh, here. For him, I don't have his um, his full name. Uh, a lot of our members have cultural heritage sites uh, on their land. Uh, some ancient, some relatively uh, 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 recent. How does rewilding sit um, uh, along fulfilling your responsibilities to yeah. those sites? Yeah. Well, again, remember remember the ambition. Remember the target. You know, the five percent by twenty one hundred. The current 0.3 you know percent that we have so we've got plenty of opportunities for rewilding without having to do it right on top of really significant cultural heritage features and landscapes and you know there are for example scheduled ancient monuments littered around in places like the peak district where allowing natural regeneration or, or doing tree planting on them is, is an absolute non-starter 
and there are places in in the Lake District which are you know high quality world heritage site cultural heritage features which one wouldn't want to start rewilding in but there are plenty of places throughout the Lake District uh, where where rewilding would genuinely improve the landscape as well as of course delivering all of these these public goods and biodiversity etc so you know we shouldn't get hung up on the on the on these uh, these places where there's likely to be conflict we shouldn't you know we shouldn't be targeting those we should be targeting them where people are willing to do it where there's little chance of significant impact on some of the scheduled feature or something that's considered culturally or ecologically very very important we've got plenty of space to work in and we've got plenty of opportunity so um so i you know personally i don't that's not a that's not a constraint at this point in time and loads of questions Alistair. Uh, about about scale yeah uh, uh, you most of CLA members run fairly small operations the average CLA member has about 200 acres is there um, are there constraints there or can any any farmer just put aside one acre half an acre um, uh, to rewilding does that make a difference or does it have to be on a thousand acre scale yeah, yeah. Another one of our key principles is that size matters uh, when it comes to rewilding, and, and, and particularly the ability to move up that rewilding spectrum. But we don't want to deter anyone from making a start on this. And we've had, you know, dozens, if not hundreds, of approaches from small farmers who want to rewild, uh, uh, and people even in urban situations who want to rewild roundabouts or road verges or gardens, etc. And, and, and the answer is yes, you can make, you can make steps, little steps up that spectrum, but you, you are going to be constrained uh, in terms of your ability to have small numbers of large herbivores roaming freely uh, across land, because if you've only got 50 acres or so, uh, that's, just not, that's just not going to be possible. You are going to have to still manage that quite intensively. Um, so it, it is a question of, you know, of how, how big can you go? And what we always say to people in that situation, please talk to your neighbours. You may find out that you've got neighbours who are actually of the same mind. And, 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 and can you start to join up um, so that you create a, a much bigger scale of operation? Um, but yeah, we, there, there's room for everyone. But, you know, we, we say roughly, I mean, it's a bit arbitrary, but I say roughly speaking, over, if you're operating at over a thousand acres, you've got a, every chance that you can be moving a, a, a significant way up this rewilding spectrum and starting to deliver natural processes to the extent that you can significantly measure biodiversity improvement. You can significantly, you can, you can demonstrate significant improvement in these public goods that we talked about earlier. Um, so that's the kind of scale that I'm, I'm tending to focus on simply because I'm covering the country and I'm only three days a week. So I'm having to draw the line somewhere. And I, you know, if there are any CLA uh, members or indeed others listening in who are over a thousand acres in scale or jointly with their neighbours are of that scale, uh, are interested in considering rewilding, I'd love to hear from you. Really interesting question here uh, about, about generations. And are you finding that um, the uh, successor generations coming through uh, are looking at their land in a completely different way? Or is, is that just one of those things that perhaps, you know, newspaper, newspapers might talk about, but in reality, everybody is equally interested or indeed equally skeptical? <laughs> no, I, I think it, there is, it, that's fair. You know, it's not always the case. Sometimes I'm dealing with um, uh, people of my generation or older, but, uh, but it is, I think it's true to say that in most cases, I'm dealing with sons of and daughters of the landowner who've recently handed over or there is they are in the process of handing over and the next generation are looking for a, perhaps a more, a more diversified approach uh, and uh, are wanting to do good things knowing as they do uh, about you know the biodiversity crisis, crisis and the climate emergency so so I think yes there is there is a difference between generational approaches and again, some quite a few questions along the same theme on, uh, I suppose it's the, the land abandonment question really about really, uh, if a landowner was today gonna say, okay, I'm gonna rewild part of my 
uh, 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 land, what is it that they do straight away? Are they planting trees and shrubs? Are they simply allowing nature to take its course? Uh, and a particular question here of, uh, about open water. Um, gentlemen, uh, Mr. Clark, we have kept the ponds on our farm regularly desalted de to maintain their diversity in open water. In a rewilded landscape, would these just be allowed to silt up and ultimately become scrub and woodland? Okay, there's two sort of two separate things. So I'll, I'll take the first one. Um, what what do you do to get started? And 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 I you usually it's a case of what is happening at the moment that is suppressing natural regeneration. And of course, in some cases, it's intensive grazing, or it's uh, occasionally arable, plow, you know, ploughing the land um, and preventing uh, things from developing naturally. So you, you look first at what is suppressing natural regeneration. And then again, applying common sense, you know, uh, considering whether allowing natural regeneration, removing the grazing pressure, and allowing natural regeneration will lead to more trees and scrub and a healthier mix of herbaceous vegetation in that landscape. And almost always the answer is yes, that, that is what will happen. So the first thing is to remove the grazing pressure and let, let nature start to lead the way. Now, in some places, like in Allerdale in Northern Scotland, which I've been to several times, you, you are going to have to plant trees because it is so far to a significant mature tree seed source that the only way to make a, a, a difference in a, in, a, in a generation or two is to plant lots of trees as they've done, nearly a million trees at, at Scots Pine. But, but in much of Britain, natural regeneration actually will be enough because you will be close enough to good tree seed sources. But there will always be a need for planting as well in, in some areas to help speed things up. So that would be the first instance. Um, then the business about ponds and silting up. Well, generally speaking, ponds in a natural situation will not silt up very much at all, unless they're in a, in a natural floodplain where, where alluvial silt is being brought into them. So one has to look at where is the sediment source. If you're rewilding and you've got ponds in that landscape, you would be wanting to stop unnatural levels of sediment from passing across the land into watercourses and ponds anyway. So that's the first thing to say. If you restored a natural, healthy, functioning ecosystem, that's going to be significantly reduced. But also, if there are ponds that do silt up, but you've got lots of ponds throughout the landscape at different stages, then I would, you know, personally, I wouldn't worry about it. You would let, you would let those ponds be. They're going to be great for other types of biodiversity in a silted up condition. Um, but you wouldn't necessarily want everything to be the same. But if you've got a naturalistic regime, you won't have all your ponds silting up anyway. So we've done all that. We've decided we're going to rewild part of our estate, or part of our farm. Uh, we've planted some trees or some shrubs, perhaps. We've allowed nature to take its course on the ponds. But then 10, 20 years time, uh, or even 50 years time, uh, we need that land back, be it for food production or for any other purposes. Is this a one-way ticket? Once you've rewilded, is that it? Um, or, uh, or is it possible to develop a project that has a lifespan? Yeah. Um, well, no, it's not a one-way ticket. Um, we, we um, you know, it could be that something really horrible happens, like the Third World War or something, and we, we have to produce all of our own food in this country and put up the barriers around the coast. Um, if that were to happen, you know, we, we would have to revert back and start growing more food and, and we just would have to undo certain locations if in that extreme situation. We've done it before. Stone Age man managed it. It's happening now on HS2. You know, it's not beyond the wit of man to, to, to quickly do, as we did after the war, um, uh, what is necessary. But my view is, if, you, if we significantly ramp up the uh, number of locations where we are rewilding and get to that 5% level, it wouldn't matter significantly in biodiversity terms in the country as a whole if you did have to plough up a net in one, loca in one county and, and maybe another one uh, uh, further north. It, 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 you, you could live with that because you've got so many sites and so much biodiversity able to spread out from those sites. 
And by the way, it's not just about having these core areas for rewilding, but we do need that connectivity through the landscape, through high end uh, agri, agri environment type activity. Um, so it, it's very, very important that, you know, you, you don't just have these isolated satellite sites. Um, there needs to be this greater connectivity. And if you have that connectivity, then as I say, if you lose an individual core site, because um, it has to be dug up to plant potatoes or something, mm. not the end of the world because you've got connectivity that can allow species to move around. We've got time just for one last question. I'm so sorry, I'm going to hog it to myself. <laughs> uh, you know, we are one country, one family of countries in the United Kingdom. What, what's happening elsewhere in the world? Are there any, uh, any particular countries that are doing this exceptionally well? Well, there's some great, great examples from the around the world. I just um, tweeted an example from Patagonia in Chile, um, which is truly astonishing, the scale of what they're doing there. Um, but, you know, if we come to Europe, for example, um, there are some great projects in Eastern Europe, for, which are much bigger. And of course, there's much less, uh, much less of a population pressure problem from humans there. But there are some great things happening in the Netherlands, very similar um, to the sorts of things we're trying to do. What I'd like to flag at this stage is that there is a European rewilding network, network which helps to bring people together and share information about those projects, but we are also setting up a rewilding Britain network and that's exactly what we want to do because there are so many people now starting to rewild. We want to share best practice uh, around the country, we want to uh, provide information and support and all the kind of information that I've been providing today and the kind of questions that your audience have been asking, we, we, we're going to provide this, create this network to help field a lot of this and share it around the country. And in those other countries, particularly similar countries, fairly local countries, mm. are you seeing more government buy-in for rewilding? Because I'm aware that you know, a number of uh, uh, participants here are talking about, you know, this is a great idea, this is all well and good, but ultimately without ELMS payments, without government support, I just can't afford to do it. Are governments giving farmers and landowners in other countries that support? Um, it's, a, it's a mixed picture. Um, what I particularly, the example I'd like to cite is, the, is in the Netherlands and uh, uh, where I've seen a site near Nijmegen called Geldersee Port. And there the government funded uh, the, a, a strategy for landowners to be moved out of the floodplain where they were continually getting flooded uh, uh, and their crops were, con and, uh, were continually being trashed, to buy land for them out of the floodplain and do land transfers out of the floodplain area and then rewild that floodplain on a, on a huge scale uh, on the Rhine so that um, it, it is now a just astonishing sight. You can see white-tailed eagles and beavers and there are still farmers grazing rare breed animals in that landscape but small numbers of them and people can cycle out of Nijmegen for a couple of miles into this amazing wild area and and that was uh, after a lot of work by Rewilding Europe actually and other organizations that was government supported and I would you know I really think our government not only should be backing rewilding in elms but but should be coming up with covenanting schemes that enable riverside land particularly riparian zones of you know 20 to 50 meters to be set aside for rewilding so that we can significantly improve water quality and, and tackle flood risk whilst massively improving our, our river and riverside biodiversity i think that's a great opportunity that is as yet untouched in this country and we need to be looking at exper experimenting with that. I think on that note it's time to call it a day. Professor Driver I would take you to the Sonning pub to say thank you if I could <laughs> but sadly I can't yet. Yeah. <laughs> thank, oh, you so, thank you so much for your time sharing your expertise and ideas with us uh, and thank you to uh, everybody at home wherever you are for joining us. With that I'll pass back to Michael. Yeah. Professor Driver thank you. Thank you very much everybody. Um, well, Jonathan, and especially Alistair, thank you very, very much for that. It was absolutely fascinating. Um, and I'm really sorry we couldn't answer all the questions. That, that is the most, by far, questions that we've had for any event. 
Um, and I think it's a reflection of the interest and the depth and breadth of the subject. Uh, so we'll look at doing something else on this particular area in the future, because it you know, clearly has attracted so much interest, um, as I said, both in terms of questions and both in terms of people watching. So um, thank you again for taking part. I really do hope you've enjoyed it and found it as enlightening as I have. I hope we meet again soon, perhaps as early as next Thursdays, in conversation with Victoria Prentice. Um, that's at 9.30 in the morning. Uh, that's the only time she can make it. And, uh, and then our next webinar is not next week, but it's the week after. It's an industry update um, on Wednesday, the 24th of June at 2 p.m. Uh, have a great weekend, everyone, and uh, thank you again.